My name is Sanjay Gupta. I'm a consultant cardiologist in York. Today's uh, video is on the subject of atrial fibrillation. And in this video, I particularly wanted to try and answer a question that a lot of my patients ask me. And that is, can AF be inherited? So this video is entitled, Familial AF, um, the genie in the bottle. Right, so what is AF? AF, is, um, AF stands for atrial fibrillation or AFib. AF is a heart rhythm disturbance. It is one of the commonest heart rhythm disturbances. It is often associated both with symptoms and an impact on length of life for the patient. So in terms of symptoms, when people go into AF, they can get palpitations, they can get very breathless, they can feel dizzy, and they generally feel pretty yucky. Uh, some people may not get any symptoms whatsoever. In terms of risk, the big problem with AF is that those patients who are older and who have comorbidities and who have been found to have AF tend to have a much higher risk of strokes in the future. So AF is an important heart rhythm disturbance. Now, the um, first thing to say is that the majority of patients I see with AF tend to be older. They tend to have other comorbidities such as diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, vascular disease, heart failure, sleep apnea. Uh, and when these patients come to me, they say, well, why have I developed atrial fibrillation? Why? And in those patients, I say, well, it's because probably because of age and lifestyle and your comorbidities. You know, I, I think your AF is a symptom of these things. Uh, and that's okay, because they, they understand that. But then there is another group of patients who gets AF, and these patients are young, they're healthy, they don't have any comorbidities, often they're very athletic, and in those people, um, when they come and see me, they say, well, why have I developed atrial fibrillation? And in those patients, I can't find an answer, I can't blame it on their age, I can't blame it on their lifestyles, and I'm a little bit stumped. Uh, and in those people, all I can think of is to say to them, well, maybe it's just bad luck or maybe it's just bad genetics, right? And when we think about the genetics idea of this uh, and we think a little bit more, maybe there is more to it. Uh, maybe there is more to AF than just being a symptom of comorbidities in age. Maybe genetics do play a part. Let's think of this. Um, we know that if you, you know, alcohol is toxic to the heart and sometimes when patients, when people go for a binge drink and drink a lot of alcohol, they can develop atrial fibrillation the next day or a day after. And um, in those patients, you blame it on the alcohol. You say, well, you drank excessive amounts of alcohol. We know that this can cause AF. That's why you developed AF. But when you think about it, often patients, people go for their drinking with friends, right? And, um, uh, you know, 10 people may go for a binge drink and all 10 may drink the same amount, yet one of them develops AF and the other nine don't. So why is that? It can't surely just be about the alcohol. Maybe this one person who develops the AF has some kind of genetic predisposition uh, to developing AF. So, you know, to my mind, there is a lot to it, this idea of possibly genetics influencing our ch chances of developing AF in our lifetime. Now, as our understanding of AF has improved, what we're beginning to realise is that AF can be inherited. Um, and we know this because recent studies have suggested that up to 30% of patients with AF without an identifiable cause have a familial history of AF. They will have other family members who have also had AF. And again, that's, you know, that's a high proportion. So people started getting interested in the idea as to whether AF is something which is inherited or a tendency to AF is inherited. Now, what we're also beginning to realize is that maybe uh, some people have a mutation in some gene, uh, which means that because they have the mutation, they do develop AF. But also, there may be another group of patients who develop small changes in genes, polymorphisms, where you're not getting one big mutation, but you're getting just a, a slight change, which is an acceptable change. It allows you to function normally. It's not a, it's not a mutation. Uh, it's a common alternative in terms of your genetic structure. But in combination with more of these in that person's genetic makeup, it increases your risk of developing AF. But 
in some people, you can have those little polymorphisms, those little tendencies, but then some kind of lifestyle factor or environmental factor comes along and releases the AF. And what I mean by that is in a simplistic way, some people inherit a genie called AF and some people inherit a genie in a bottle. And so the genie doesn't come out, but if you add in another factor, like a lifestyle factor, like alcohol, like something like that, you know, an environmental factor, it cracks open the bottle and the genie escapes and the AF comes out. And once the AF has come out, it has come out, um, it gets more and more difficult to try and get him back in the bottle. Uh, and even if you do, he's more likely to escape uh, again. So that I think is probably the explanation why some people uh, who are young and healthy will get AF uh, in exposure to certain things compared to other people who may not necessarily get AF. Now, as I say, AF, we're beginning to realize that AF can be inherited by a single mutation. So if you have a single mutation in your genetic structure, uh, that can uh, increase your risk of AF and at some point you develop AF. In terms of single genes, uh, one of the commonest or the most important genes that has been identified as predisposing patients to AF is something called KCNO1, which is a uh, a gene which is responsible for making an electrical potassium regulating ion which uh, is in the heart muscle cells uh, and mutations in these ionic channels can increase or decrease the flow of ions um, across the cell membranes in our heart and they may regulate the way our heart beats and geneticists are beginning to get more and more interested in finding out whether certain people have these mutations that increase the risk. So um, the KCNO1 is an important mutation but geneticists have also found mutations in sodium channels and other genes which regulate transcription factors within the heart. Um, more interestingly, so these are probably a smaller group, but more interestingly are patients who may have polymorphisms. As I say, polymorphisms are, uh, you can have a gene which may have two reasonable uh, types, you know, so in, in the sense that, you know, for example, uh, you can have polymorphisms in your ears. You know, some people have an ear lobe which is attached, some people have an ear lobe which is loose. In themselves they don't really matter they're an acceptable alternative genetically but they may increase your vulnerability slightly and if you have a bunch of these polymorphisms that come together then the risk is higher and then if you add in a toxin or a chronic disease or chronic inflammation or something like that then the bottle open breaks and the genie escapes the genie called AF okay now um, in terms of what are we what are we learning we're learning that in terms of the single mutations like the kcno1 the inheritance tends to be autosomal dominant this means that one copy of the altered gene in each cell is enough to cause the disorder so basically if you have that mutation then the, there is a 50 percent chance that you would pass it on to your child okay what about these polymorphisms? Well, in those, you know, because they're reasonable alternatives, uh, the only thing you can really do is to try and reduce the chances of exposing yourself to those toxins or environmental factors which break the bottle. Sometimes it's impossible to avoid these, but I'll talk you through some of the triggers that break the bottle and make the genie escape. Um, emotion, stress, anxiety, dehydration, physical exhaustion, lack of sleep, alcohol, especially wine, stimulants such as excessive caffeine, you know, uh, energy drinks, that kind of thing, uh, hormonal changes, uh, a bloated stomach, that's a really important one, a bloated stomach, and intercurrent illness. And when we think about it, actually these triggers seem to set off most heart rhythm disturbances. So people with ectopics will get more ectopics when they're stressed, when they're going through hormonal change, when they're getting dehydrated, when they're lacking sleep. People with um, atrial flutter will do this. People with ventricular uh, rhythm disturbance will do this. So these seem to be common triggers for all heart rhythm disturbances, but they're certainly applicable to those people um, 
with AF, particularly those people who may have familial AF, because their AF is more likely to manifest at these times. Um, and usually I would say that it's a, a combination of different triggers that come together and increase the risk. So, for example, AF is known as the holiday heart syndrome. Now, what do we mean by the holiday heart syndrome? It is not uncommon to find people who go away on holiday, you know, go and have um, more alcohol coming back and then when they come back they develop atrial fibrillation and then those people will say oh yeah you developed atrial fibrillation because you were on holiday and you had excessive amounts of alcohol but perhaps it's more than just the alcohol perhaps it is that they have this genetic vulnerability they then often have, go you know without sleep or have to take an early morning flight so they are sleep deprived they're tired on the on the plane they get dehydrated they have alcohol they get to their destination, which is often a warm place, they have more alcohol, they get more dehydrated, and they overindulge with food and they get bloated stomach. And maybe it's a combination of all these things coming together, which causes the atrial fibrillation to come out. Um, now, the next question is, well, how can our knowledge of AF genetics help us in the future? Because this is a really exciting space. And I guess the main thing is at this point in time we treat everyone in the same way you know if you have atrial fibrillation we want to know how old you are whether you have diabetes or high blood pressure or anything like that and if you do then we say oh your risk of strokes is high and you need to be taking an anticoagulant for the rest of your life the problem with that is that uh, some patients, you know, we're treating everyone the same, whereas it may well be that some patients are at lower risk, some patients are at higher risk. And if we found that there were certain AF mutations which increased your risk of AF, but didn't actually increase your risk of strokes, uh, then based on those, based on identifying those mutations in patients with suffer who, who've got their AF, maybe we would be less likely to anticoagulate them because we would feel comforted that this is not a complication of people who develop AF as a result of this particular genetic mutation. Uh, another thing which would be useful is if we knew which electrical channels had the mutations and we could identify them, then that may allow us to target our treatments to those particular electronic ch channels rather than necessarily giving them a generic medicine, uh, which may work for some people but may not work for others. So it may allow us to target um, treatment a lot better. Uh, and I think, you know, the, the, I think the other thing I would say is that if uh, you, I mean, this is a very interesting space and there's going to be a ton of research. But the one thing I would say is that if you do have a family history of AF and um, uh, are contemplating getting medical insurance, then I would certainly recommend it now because as we start learning more about genetic causes of AF, I suspect that insurance companies will start discriminating against those people who have a familial history of hyper AF, even though you may never have had AF and the premiums would go up, etc. So the sooner we uh, uh, cover ourselves and make sure that we're covered, the better. Um, because as we know more, maybe, um, you know, we'll be able to work out um, who is more likely to develop AF and what the best treatments are going to be. So I hope you found this useful. I would love to hear your comments. And once again, thank you for all that you do for me. All the best. Take care. Bye.